and it makes it a bit harder than when somebody's been through what she was and then can, comes out the other side of it and is in a really good place to suddenly have that cut as well then. Um, you know, she was in really good spirits on that Friday. The Cranberries proved to be Ireland's biggest musical export since U2's rise to prominence in the 80s. The 90s brought them great success with their first two albums, but by the end of the decade the band was on the brink of imploding, with cancelled shows, controversy and label problems eventually leading to the band falling apart in the early noughties. After a six-year hiatus, the band re-emerged, strong as ever, but another decade later, tragedy struck with the accidental death of Dolores O'Riordan. As you'll find out later in the video, Dolores was at a point in her life of renewed optimism, which makes this story all the more heartbreaking. Hi, I'm Adam, welcome back to Music Mongoose. Dolores was born in 1971 into a strict Catholic household. She grew up with her six, mostly male, older siblings in the Irish countryside, near the city of Limerick in a two-bedroom house. Her older sister accidentally burned the house down when Dolores was seven. But the local, tight-knit community were able to raise enough money to rehouse them in a bigger home nearby. Now, her father was left brain damaged after a biking accident in 1968, which meant her mother was the breadwinner for the family. As it turns out, this family dynamic would be a huge factor in Dolores' decision to start singing. She told Rolling Stone in 1995, My mum always had a softer spot for boys, as a lot of Irish women do. If you were a girl, you'd have to sing or wear a pretty dress. But boys could just sit there and be brilliant for sitting there and being boys. It makes you that little bit more forward, pushy. I was singing, always. This musical talent in Dolores was evident from a young age. She would play the organ at the local church for eight years. And at the age of just five years old, adults were so impressed with her singing voice that her headmistress at school would hoist her on top of a piano so she could sing in front of the 12-year-olds. It gave her that musical bug pretty early on in her life. There, at school, an Irish national school, she would have Irish values instilled into her. She remembers being taught to play the tin whistle and Irish dance in class. She also learnt classical piano as a child too, and by the age of just 12 she had written her first song. It was called Calling, and it was about having a crush on a 40-year-old man. At school, her nickname became The Girl Who Wrote Songs. But back at home, growing up with five older brothers, she was a tomboy, through and through. She became used to boys, as there weren't many girls living where she grew up. And perhaps this is the reason for her dominance in a very male-heavy music industry. So when she heard about a bunch of boys in a band looking for a female vocalist, it was a no-brainer. She auditioned immediately. The group were called Cranberry Saurus. And if you say it fast enough and with an Irish accent, it sounds like Cranberry Sauce. They were a novelty act. But in 1990, they were looking for a new female vocalist to complement their evolution into a more serious band, with a, with a more dreamy, shimmering sound. The band consisted of brothers Noel and Mike Hogan on bass and guitar. The drummer was a friend of theirs, Fergal Lawler. So, aged 18, Dolores lugged her keyboard across Limerick to audition for Cranberry Sauce. Noel would tell Rolling Stone in 2018, We were blown away that this small girl from Limerick had such an amazing voice. The fact that she wasn't already in a band was a miracle. Now, Dolores was by no means a fan of their music at this point. If anything, she was auditioning them as much as they were auditioning her. She said, It was easy for me, because I knew, no matter what their first impressions were, that the minute I opened my mouth, that they were going to be impressed. I think that's such a great reflection of the kind of girl that Dolores was. She wasn't going to be intimidated by these boys. If anything, she was going to use them to kickstart her career. And luckily, Dolores did see potential in their playing ability. She left that interview with a recording of an instrumental that the band had put together. It was nothing mind-blowing, four looping chords, really. And she returned to them a week later with a melody and lyrics to go along with those looping chords. Safe to say, she nailed the audition and got the job. That song would turn out to be Linger, which would become one of the Cranberries' biggest hits. The lyrics were written about Dolores' first boyfriend, a 17-year-old soldier who'd write love letters to her while deployed in Lebanon. At the time, the music scene in Limerick was mostly made of men, but the songs were humorous and nonsensical. 
So Dolores wasn't confident that her deeply emotional personal song would find an audience. But Noel, Mike, and Fergal believed in it, and after hearing Linga for the first time, were pretty confident with their new sound. Dolores and Noel formed a songwriting partnership, continued to write songs, and the band went about recording a demo to send to record labels. They got help with this from Pierce Gilmore, a local musician who owned a studio, Zeric. Cranberry Saurus recorded their first demo. It was an EP, four tracks, called Water Circle. Noel began sending their demo to radio stations and record labels. One label sent their tape back in the post, but it was addressed to the Cranberries, instead of Cranberry Saurus. So they changed their name there and then to the Cranberries. And as it turned out, the labels that they sent their demo to were pretty interested. The likes of Rough Trade, Virgin, Island, EMI all had interest in signing the band. Dolores recounted once that 32 label reps flew to Ireland to see the Cranberries play in a university showcase. This, by the way, was only six months after the band had formed, and they had only written six songs. So clearly, these labels saw something special in the Cranberries. Eventually, inspired by the success of U2, the Cranberries signed to the same label, Island Records. In 1991, they released their first EP for Island, released under the name Zeric Records, called Uncertain, produced again by Pierce Gilmore. Hogan later said that Gilmore cluttered the mixes with dance beats and industrial style guitar, and this led to a conflictual relationship between Gilmore and the band. After the first EP, which failed to chart, the band hit the road, supporting the likes of Duran Duran and Suede, but ran into more problems. You see, they weren't a very good live act. They would stand on stage, pretty quiet, often just looking at their feet, and their equipment would fail pretty often too. The touring lifestyle had also left a sour taste in the mouths of the band members. Dolores had to sleep on the legs of Mike and Noel because there simply wasn't enough room in the van. In 1992, the Cranberries got to work on their first full-length album for Island Records. Pierce Gilmore was replaced with Stephen Street, best known at the time for his work with The Smiths, Morrissey, and Blur. Following the release of singles Dreams and Linger, the latter of which was their highest charting in the US, their debut album was released in 1993. Everybody else is doing it, so why can't we? Although this would eventually become the biggest debut album by any Irish artist, beating U2, initially it was ignored by the British. It wasn't until it broke through in America that it would chart at number one in the UK and Ireland more than a year after its release. It became the fifth album in rock history to reach number one in the UK a year or more after its release. Here's a test for you, do you know the other four albums on that list? Pop them down in the comments below and subscribe to the channel while you're there if you're enjoying the video so far. According to Dolores, the delay for the album's success was because it's very difficult to break in Europe unless you break in England, and it's very difficult to break in England if you're Irish. And why is because of history, basically. In the time between releasing the album and it gaining popularity, they were already working on the second album. They were writing it while on the road, touring. The initial demos for the second album would be recorded at the Magic Shop studio in New York City, while the group were on a week off from touring. They flew in Stephen Street from London and recorded early versions of six songs. One of those songs turned out to be the biggest song the band would ever release. Zombie. It was Zombie, obviously. Dolores had initially titled the track, In Your Head. Noel Hogan reflects on first hearing the demo. It was a change in direction sound-wise, obviously a lot harder than anything we've done. Dolores brought it in and she was playing it on an acoustic. We started doing what we'd normally do and made it that kind of sweet indie pop thing. It was one of the times where she said, look, that's not gonna really work with this. It's a kind of I'm pissed off song. I'm angry about this and I think the music should reflect it. So she wanted me to play harder on the guitar and certainly on the drums as well. When we did Zombie, we realized that you can actually be heavy and still have melody. The song itself is an anti-war anthem condemning the ethno-nationalist conflict in Northern Ireland or The Troubles, as it was known. This was a conflict that lasted for around 30 years, from the late 60s to 1998. It claimed three and a half thousand lives, more than half of which were civilians. 
In particular, Dolores was inspired to write the song after an incident that took place on March 20th, 1993. Explosives hidden by the IRA in Litterbins on the busy Bridge Street in Warrington, England, killed a 3-year-old and a 12-year-old boy, and injured 56 more. The Cranberries were on tour in the UK at the time it happened, and Dolores heard the news while sat in the tour bus in London. The news stuck with her and inspired her to write the song. The track was recorded in Dublin, again with Stephen Street, and they experimented with live feedback and distortion in the studio, giving it its sort of grungy feel. People even accused the band of capitalising off of the rise of grunge from Seattle with bands like Nirvana and Soundgarden, but Dolores insisted that the sound came organically for them in the studio. They weren't trying to rip anyone off. According to Alan Kovac, the group's former manager, Island Records urged the band not to release the song as a single because of its political sensitivity. They apparently even offered Dolores $1 million to work on something else instead, but she refused and ripped up the check. Kovac would later say, Her belief was that she was an international artist, and she wanted to break the rest of the world, and Zombie was part of that evolution. She felt the need to expand beyond I love you, you love me, and write about what was happening in Ireland at the time. The IRA are not me. I'm not the IRA. The Cranberries are not the IRA. My family are not. When it says in the song, it's not me, it's not my family, that's what I'm saying. It's not Ireland. Dolores would later say about the track. Despite the hesitance from Island Records, Zombie was released in September 1994 as the first single for their second album. It reached number one in a number of countries across the world, and won Best Song at the 1995 MTV Europe Music Awards. Speaking of MTV, their support of the song's music video played a big part in its popularity. Directed by Samuel Bayer, the video features genuine British soldiers and local children filmed in Belfast. No need to argue, the band's follow-up was released in October 1994 and proved to be an even bigger hit than their first album, riding on the monumental success of Zombie. Noel would say that the band's heavy touring schedule resulted in the group maturing as musicians, making them much tighter when it came to recording the album. Hogan also said that their experience playing live contributed to the heavier sound of the second album as compared to the first. And to support the album, the band played some pretty high-profile gigs, including Woodstock 94 and an MTV Unplugged session as well. Two years later, in 1996, the group released their third album, To The Faithful Departed. It performed relatively well, shifting 4 million copies, but again was nowhere near the success of the first two albums. After the success of Zombie, the Cranberries tried to write some more politically charged songs to include in this album, including War Child and Bosnia. However, these weren't received in the same way that Zombie was, and was even called naive by some critics. After album three, the band toured. Up to this point, the band had toured the world three times in three years, with only about six weeks off in total. As with any band, this amount of touring took a toll on the relationship between the members of the group. Six months after To The Faithful Departed was released, Dolores injured her knee, and the remaining 80-plus dates on the tour were cancelled, citing Dolores' stress and exhaustion as a reason. After around five years of constant work, this was the band's first proper break. The members wouldn't meet for months at a time, although the odd collaboration did take place. In 1997, Dolores and Noel recorded a cover of Fleetwood Mac's Go Your Own Way, for example. The rest of 1997 would see the male members of the band travelling the world and creating bits and pieces of music, while Dolores remained in Toronto with her husband, Don Burton, former tour manager of Duran Duran. She would continue to write songs for the Cranberries in this time too. In a 1999 interview, Dolores revealed how bad the situation was behind the scenes. I hated singing, I hated being on stage, I hated being in the Cranberries, and I was constantly crying. I wanted to be a shopkeeper, a hairdresser, anything. I was so desperate to have a reality, friends, a regular boring life. I missed that. I wanted to make my own toast in the morning and just call my friend Nora and see what was up. 1999 would see the release of their fourth album, Bury the Hatchet, an album with a focus on happiness. It sold 2.4 million copies worldwide and went gold in America. Great, but again, not anywhere close to those first two albums. However, releasing this album did reignite Dolores' love for playing in a band. 
That theme of happiness continued with Wake Up and Smell the Coffee, released in 2002, an album made by a band whose members were now all married and raising families. This maturity rings through the record. Never Grow Old and Pretty Eyes were inspired by the birth of Dolores' second child. Now, you know how I said those last two albums were all themed around happiness? Well, behind the scenes, it was anything but. Major label mergers meant that the band were no longer with Island Records. Eventually, they were transferred to MCA. Their fourth album would be the first and only release with MCA. They were unhappy with the promotion of the album and decided to terminate their contract. You need to understand as well that the people they signed with, with Island Records in 1991, had all changed 12 years later. All the people they worked with and had a healthy working relationship with had either been fired or had left the company. So they didn't feel like MCA had the Cranberry's creative vision at the top of their priority list. At the end of 2003, the band announced that they would take a hiatus to focus on solo projects and spend more time with their families. Dolores recorded several solo albums and collaborations with other artists. After six long years, the Cranberries regrouped, releasing Roses in 2009, one of the critically stronger albums to date. By 2012, Dolores was dealing with a pill and alcohol addiction. Her marriage was also falling apart in 2014. In this year, she was arrested for causing a disturbance on a flight. She headbutted a police officer and told the police, you can't arrest me, I'm an icon. She dodged jail time, but was diagnosed with bipolar. After splitting with Don Burton, Dolores moved to New York and worked on a new side project, a band called Dark, with former Smiths bassist Andy Rourke. In her final years, her bandmates noted the improvement of her mental health. She was a lot more herself, especially last year when we were rehearsing, Noel told The Guardian. You wouldn't even know, because they had found the right cocktail of whatever it was she needed to be on. There wasn't even a case of having to work around it. In 2017, the Cranberries released the album Something Else, which featured unplugged and orchestral versions of 10 previously released singles, plus three new songs. From here, with her mental health improving, working again with the Cranberries and her new side project Dark, Dolores was full of optimism and a joy for life. She was also planning to record with American band Bad Wolves. They were doing a cover of Zombie, and Dolores loved it so much, she agreed to do the vocals on it. On January 14th, 2018, Dolores flew from her home in New York to the Park Lane Hilton in London. According to her agent, the main purpose of her visit was for a studio mixing session with Martin Glover for Dark's second album. She was also due to meet with BMG, the Cranberry's new record label. According to The Guardian, at the time, Dolores was sending vocals for the new Cranberry's material to Noel Hogan via email. She emailed him for the last time on the 14th of January. In the very early hours of the 15th, she left a voicemail message for label exec and good friend Dan Waite about the Bad Wolves zombie cover. TMZ actually acquired this voicemail, I'll link it down below so you can hear it. And in that voicemail, you can really hear the optimism in her voice, just the pure joy of life in her voice, which makes what happened later all the more heartbreaking. Again, according to The Guardian, she spoke with her mother on the phone at 2am. At 9.16am, Dolores was found unresponsive in her hotel bathroom. The cause of death was accidental drowning. Prescription medication was found in her room and a therapeutic level of alcohol found in her blood. The coroner, Dr. Shirley Radcliffe said, there's no evidence that this was anything other than an accident. There was no intention. This seems to be solely a tragic accident. Just four days after her death, Bad Wolves went ahead and released their cover of Zombie. It topped the US rock charts and performed well on the pop charts, peaking at 54. Reflecting on the track, Fergal Lawler admitted, I didn't really like it, it wasn't my cup of tea. While Noel Hogan, meanwhile, said that he thought the cover was released a bit too soon for my liking anyway. The whole thing seemed insensitive or something. Bad Wolves donated $250,000 to the children of Dolores O'Riordan. In 2019, the Cranberries released their final studio album, appropriately named In The End. It featured Dolores' posthumous vocals. The surviving band members pieced together her demos and emailed vocals, as mentioned before, to produce the album, again with Stephen Street. It received positive reviews from critics. 
it reached number 10 on the UK album chart. And this was the last release before the Cranberries officially confirmed their disbandment. The thing that makes this story so heart-wrenching is that Dolores was on a roll when she died. Sure, she'd been through some pretty low points, but at that time, she was full of vigor and optimism for life. We can only imagine what Dolores would have brought to the table for the Cranberries, Dark, and other collaborations, because clearly she wasn't done with making music. Now, for another story about the tragic death of a band's lead vocalist, check out my video on Joy Division and how love tore Ian Curtis apart.